God. This is a branch sprung from the tree of thy mercy. Through thy grace and bounty, enable him to grow, and through the showers of thy generosity, cause him to be a verdant, flourishing, blossoming, and fruitful branch. Gladden the eyes of his parents, thou who giveth to whomsoever thou willest, and bestow upon him the name Shoghi, so that he may yearn for thy kingdom and soar into the realms of the unseen. Abdul Baha. The family of Abdul Baha lived for decades amidst the severe privations of the prison city of Akka. It was a hard life for anyone, especially children. Many died, including the sons of Abdul Baha. Thus, there must have been happiness in the household on March 1, 1897, when Abdul Baha's eldest daughter, Ziaya Hanun, and her husband Mirza Hadi Shirazi Afnan gave birth to their first son. The child was given the name Shogi, the one who yearns. As a young child, Shogi Effendi was small, sensitive, and intensely active. His mother often had cause to worry over his health, but he grew up to have an iron constitution, which coupled with the phenomenal force of his nature and willpower enabled him to overcome every obstacle in his path. Shoghi Effendi was reared in the house of Abdul Baha in Haifa and received the best education possible. Under Abdul Baha's supervision, he attended the Jesuit school, the most reputable in the city. Unhappy there, he transferred to the Syrian Protestant College, later known as the American University of Beirut, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1918. As a young scholar, one of Shoghi Effendi's greatest interests was geography. He became a prolific maker of maps, a talent which he later used to chart the progress of the cause throughout the Western world. In the spring of 1920, Shoghi Effendi left Haifa for England, where he studied at Balliol College, Oxford. During his time at Oxford, he distinguished himself as a peerless scholar of English. His translations of the sacred writings from Persian and Arabic attain a standard which will never be surpassed. In frequent letters written to Abdul Baha, Shoghi Effendi described his desire to serve the faith, saying, I am directing and concentrating all my efforts on my studies and doing my utmost to acquire that which will benefit and prepare me to serve the cause in the days to come. My hope is that I may speedily acquire the best that this country and this society have to offer, and then return to my home and recast the truths of the faith in a new form, and thus serve the holy threshold. While in England, Shoghi Effendi often visited the Baha'is of Manchester, one of England's earliest Baha'i communities. When not in school, he would return to Haifa and spend time with his beloved grandfather, serving as a secretary and translator of his tablets. During these visits, Shoghi Effendi met with many pilgrims and distinguished Baha'is who spoke of the progress of the faith in both the East and the West. Amatul Baha Rahia Hanum shares her memories of Shoghi Effendi. The guardian was uh, always very dear to the heart of Abdul Baha. He was his eldest grandson. And of course, the first will of Abdul Baha, because he wrote three wills, what we call the will and testament of Abdul Baha, is in three different sections. 
And very early, I think the first uh, intimation of the guardianship, if I remember, was when Shogi Fendi was about 12 years old. But then, of course, nobody knew. This was very secret. Um, you know, Abdul Baha, I don't think many of the Baha'is realize Abdul Baha had some sons. Some of them died in infancy, and one son died, I think, when he was three or four years old. And um, then he was left with these four daughters, and three of them married, and one of them never, uh, one, the fourth one also married, but never had any children. Three of them had children. And he had um, 13 grandchildren. And Shogi Fendi was the eldest grandchild from the eldest daughter of Abdul Baha. And of course, he showed what it says in the Will and Testament that the, the child is the secret essence of the sire. And Shogi Fendi showed in himself these characteristics that were inherited from the master. In other words, there was no doubt about it, that he was a different type from the others, different caliber. And he was very, very heartbroken, you see, after the passing of Abdul Baha. The master died when he was in London. He, I don't know whether the Baha'is realize to what an extent it affects him. Tudor Pole, who was an Englishman, a great friend of the master, an admirer of the master, sent for Shoghi Effendi from Oxford to come to London. And he had received word from Haifa because he was the correspondent for the Baha'is in England that Abdul Baha had passed away. So he sent for Shoghi Effendi to come and tell him this. And uh, the guardian was in his office, and for a moment he went, as I understood, into another room. And lying on the table, right, so to speak, in front of his eyes, he didn't make any effort to poke his nose around, but he saw this cable with the word Abdul Baha in it, and he said that Abdul Baha had ascended, you see. And he fainted. You, Tudor Pole came into the room, and the guardian was unconscious on the floors. It was such a terrible, terrible shock to him. Well, that was shock number one. Then shock number two was when they read the Will and Testament, which, as I said before, he anticipated that his eldest grandson, he might be asked to read the will, to open it, break the seals. He found that he had been made it, so to speak. He was the head of the faith and the successor of Abdul Baha. And he had a terrible time coming to terms with that. And I think that the mountains meant something to him. He could, he could uh, commune with his own spirit, I suppose. I don't know. I wasn't in him or with him. But I suppose he had to come to grips with it. He had to commune with his own spirit and uh, find a way to go back to Haifa and face the responsibility of a whole Baha'i religion that depended on his guidance as a successor of Abdul Baha, which is a terrific thing, you see. And he fled from it more than once, literally fled from it. They had to come and, and beg him. The greatest holy leaf sent for him and, and, and begged him to come back. I can remember when my mother and I said goodbye to Shoghi Effendi, and he called us to his bedroom. And he was lying in bed, and there was just the thing I can remember, he was this young man, and nothing but eyes. He was so wan, you see, and worn out with this um, shock that had come to him and the terrible responsibility and the beginning of fermentation amongst the covenant breakers, you see. It never left the Baha'i faith. Thank heaven the House of Justice hasn't had this problem, but up till the end of the Guardian's life, the Bab had defection, Baha'u'llah had defection, Abdul Baha had defection to deal with, Shoghi Effendi had defection to deal with, you see. And it just prostrated him. And he told my mother and me, he said, you know, Mrs. Maxwell, I can't stand it. I'm leaving. And as I say, more than once, he literally fled to the mountains of Switzerland and walked in the wilderness, I suppose, trying to come to grips with his grief and with his responsibility. Tremendous thing. 
And then he just had this great love for the mountains and love for Switzerland, love nature, but particularly the mountains. And I remember he told me that on one occasion he had walked over two of the great Swiss passes and that it had rained very hard and he got drenched to the skin and that by the time he walked down that pass and up the other pass, he was all dried off. I suppose from the wind, the sun perhaps, and from his own body heat from climbing and from walking. Yet, as I said, a particular love for this country. The history of this uh, building is really extraordinary. In uh, 1890, approximately, Baha'u'llah came here, visited Haifa, sat here amongst those trees, and told his son Abdul Baha, bring the body of the Bab, which had been hidden for 60 years in Persia, and bury it here, buy this land and bury it here. Abdul Baha did this. He was a prisoner of the Turks. He was sometimes very strictly confined in the prison city of Akka. But he managed to buy this property. Although he had practically just emerged from his imprisonment, to come and bury the remains of the Bab in six rooms of this building which he had constructed. Very simple rooms, but very firmly and well built and he entombed the remains of the Bab that had been brought from Persia in 1909. In 1928, Shoghi Fendi added three more rooms here at the back because he knew that it had to be symmetrical, nine rooms with the body of the Bab in the center. And then in 1944, he unveiled the plan for the superstructure of the tomb of the Bob. My father was a very famous Canadian architect, and he was living here with Shoghi Effendi and me during the war and after the war. And the guardian said, I want you to design this structure of the Bob shrine. It was unveiled in 1944, and it was a very a um, precious occasion, and then Shoghi Effendi announced that the model for the shrine of the Bab had been chosen, and he began the construction of this work in 1946. And all of this Shoghi Effendi supervised himself. I can't go into the details, but he had the whole project carried out directly under his supervision. He used to come, it was in war years when we had no pilgrims, used to come and stand here 
and direct the laborers with the excavation. We even had our own railway in front of the shrine to fill the dump in at the other end. But eventually, this wonderful building was finished in 1953. I don't think that the Baha'is appreciate the fact that this monument of the sister of Abdul Baha, the greatest holy leaf, Bahia Khanum, is really the hub of all of this development that we are looking at at the present time on Mount Carmel, except for the shrine of the Bab, which is, of course, the fixed point of the forerunner of the Baha'i faith. What people don't understand is that this tremendous love and respect that Chogi Fendi had for his great aunt, for the sister of Abdul Baha, his beloved grandfather, and the fact that he instructed that she should be buried here on Mount Carmel was the point of the development of this entire ark. Shoghi Fendi, first of all, had, when he was absent, his great aunt died. He was heartbroken, and he instructed exactly where she should be buried. Then, after my marriage, many, many years later, I think it was in 1941, if I remember correctly, he brought the mother and brother of his aunt, the greatest holy leaf, to be buried here on Mount Carmel, because she said, I always want to be buried next to my mother. And instead of taking the mother, the, the greatest holy leaf, over to the mother in the cemetery of Akka, which was really a horrible place, he exhumed the remains of the mother and the brother and brought them and built two more little Greek love temples, if you like, on top of their resting places. And eventually, his grandmother, the wife of Abdul Baha, was buried in this fourth grave. So that this is a cemetery. And I think it's very significant that what seems to be a place of light and beauty and joy and love is the center of a graveyard. And I think that one has to realize that the guardian himself laid all of these gardens out. He chose the position. He, with his own hands, I was present the night that he entombed these remains here with so much reverence and respect, and hundreds of Baha'is uh, in torchlight gathered around while they were buried here. This place is so full of not only history, but of significance. Shoghi Fendi did almost everything himself. The interesting thing about this archives, which is the Museum of Baha'i Historic Objects, is that it was uh, not only designed, as you can see in the Greek style, based roughly on the proportions of the Parthenon, but uh, Shoghi Fendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, did something I have never seen before in my life. He developed the whole garden in front of the building before it was built and he built the building from the back into the empty space towards the front. So that when the building was completed, the whole garden was completed in front of it and the trees were growing and everything was beautiful. And he lived to see this. He didn't live to see uh, himself to furnish the interior, but he lived to see this beautiful building that was really his conception. The architect said, I have nothing to do with this building. This building was designed by Shoghi Effendi. And it set the pace for all of these buildings on the Ark. What I don't think the Baha'is realize is that these gardens are the manifestation of the most extraordinary sense of proportion. Proportion is beauty. And Shoghi Fendi had this wonderful sense of proportion. You see it in the monuments, these beautiful graves. You see it in this building, which is surely something that if he had been alive, he would have approved of because it is typical Greek in style. You see it in the gardens that he laid out. 
You see it in his writings. All of this work on these gardens, he did himself. He had very little money. So every year, he would do one section of the gardens, according to his possibilities. And that's the charm of them, that they're not laid out like Versailles or one of the famous gardens of the world, all in one block, like a landscape gardener. They are something that grew piece by piece. And this is the entire charm of the gardens. He used to stand here by the hour. He had all these palm trees planted by measurement by hand. He used to tell the gardeners, make a vajab. This is a vajab in Arabic, a span. He'd say, Me measure five vajabs. So the gardener would go along like that where there was five. Then he'd say, plant the tree there. He said, make the path one meter 20 wide. Make the steps into the embankment, so and so many steps. He used to ask me, how many steps do you think we need? And I would make him a paper model. And then he could see how the steps would look in one of these banks of flowers that he was working on. But he did the whole thing himself. And he did it at, at great economy because he was spending the money of the Baha'is of the world. And it's an example, frankly, to all of us. I would like to tell you uh, something about Shoghi Fendi's method of work. Violet and I were talking about the meeting today, and she suggested that it would interest the students to know how Shoghi Fendi wrote. Well, all the years that I had the great blessing of being with him, which was 20 years, he wrote some very important things. And uh, I remember he wrote Advent of Divine Justice and these world order letters that he sent out. And uh, then he worked on God Passes By. But his method was very interesting. When I uh, take God Passes By because it's such a large work, such a major work, he wanted it published on the 100th anniversary of the Bab, 1944. And of course, there was still war. The whole world was still at war. The war ended in 1945. This was 44. And Shoghi Fendi was a small person and very meticulous. He was an extremely uh, neat. He always wrote on a pad that was smaller even than this. I don't know whether I can get this thing to the size that he used to write. It was very, very interesting. And we have all of these things, you know, in the International Archives. So they're all there, the original manuscripts of the Guardian, and they're very, very precious. And he had a pad that was about that size. Now, I, I really, I shouldn't mention myself and my methods and connection with The Guardian, but I have great big ugly sprawling writing and I have huge sheet of paper and I go over to the edge and so on. And The Guardian had a pad that size and had very meticulous handwriting with a slight backhand. And uh, he wrote everything out that he was composing in, in God Passes by copious notes. For one year he sat down and read and studied. The second year, of course, he couldn't have done it, if, frankly, if it hadn't been for the war, because he was cut off from the Baha'i world, and uh, he couldn't correspond the way he would normally do with different parts of the world. All Everything behind the, the um, um, non-allied line, in other words, Japan and um, Germany and all Eastern Europe and so on, was cut off entirely from Shoghi Effendi because they were behind the enemy lines of the English and Palestine was a British mandate and we were the other side. We were the allies and they were the enemies. So he was cut off from some very big Baha'i communities, some old Baha'i communities like Germany. And uh, in any case, he had the chance to sit down and work on this very wonderful 
thing, God passes by. He read for one year, and I thought that that was very, very interesting. He read every single thing that was in Haifa. So I forget how many of these books we have from Persia, but there's a lot of them. Every scrap of paper that existed in the Holy Land, he studied before he began to write God Passes By. And he made very copious notes in his own handwriting. And then he sat down and began to compose. And he wrote um, the first draft. That was all, as I said, on a piece of paper that big, lined paper, as I remember. And um, then he would go over that and make a clean copy in his own handwriting. That meant the second handwritten copy of his book. And it's a big book, God Passes By. And then when he had done that, and he had a, an original draft, then he'd worked on it, he had a clean copy. Then he himself sat down, and on a little tiny portable uh, Remington or some kind of a typewriter, he proceeded to himself type the whole manuscript. So at the end of the day, when both of us were absolutely exhausted, we would sit down, maybe from 8 to 10 o'clock at night, and he had a big table in his um, room that he worked on. He had a desk, but he also had a table larger than this, which he used as a table to write and had his papers and things on it. And he had three copies, and I had three copies. So he had the original um, type script and two copies carbons, and I had three carbons. And we sat down until 10 o'clock at night. We would correct these six copies. So he worked on this book. And of course, it was actually published in time for um, 1944 centenary of the Bob. And that was a tremendous victory. I think that uh, obviously the greatest holy leaf uh, after the passing of Abdul Baha, probably more than anybody, certainly more than his own family, I mean his intimate members of his family, realized the importance of the guardian. And uh, she was his mainstay. In fact, she was at one point everybody's mainstay. And there's a letter, if you go back to the, the early, early letters of Shoghi Effendi, in the first volume of the Baha'i administration that was ever published, um, you find letter written by the greatest holy leaf, you see, on behalf of Shoghi Effendi. Shoghi Effendi fled to the wilderness. He couldn't stand his sorrow and his burden. And he left the greatest holy leaf. And at that period, with this heavenly spirit and faith that she had, she took over, really, being the central figure at that point of the Baha'i faith. If ever there was the, the, the meaning of a heavenly soul, it was the greatest holy leaf. The whole concept of Nazmi Badi, New World Order, was in the Guardian's uh, writings in detail. He made the world order. He, he put before us, after all, the, the, the House of Justice is unrolling, so to speak, this carpet of the New World Order that was given us by the Bab and developed in the, in the divine manifestation of Baha'u'llah and interpreted and expounded and the construction of it begun by Abdul Baha and then the implementation of so many details through his letters of the administration by the Guardian, you see. Now, what is the House of Justice doing? It's un going on unrolling this whole process with that foundation. The, co the House of Justice, we all know, is constantly goes back to the words of the Guardian. Every communication that comes from the House of Justice giving us the next step and the next measure of divine guidance is based on 
what they have already had, and largely the interpretations of Shoghi Effendi about the administrative order. It's all there. Shoghi Effendi and I, probably because of kindness to me, because I've been brought up in, and studied painting from my childhood and so on, and I, of course, always wanted to go to art galleries and museums, and many times Shoghi Effendi, I think, out of the goodness of his heart, would come with me. So we went mm -hmm. to many art galleries together. He liked the great classic painters. He liked the Botticelli, Raphael, I don't know, the classical painters. And but before I was married, you see, I was alone 15 minutes with Shoghi Effendi. I didn't know him at all. And I had no idea he was the guardian of my faith, and I adored him. And I had turned to him as a child when I heard that Abdul Baha had died. And then we, said, we heard that we had appointed the guardian of the Baha'i faith, his grandson. And then I just turned my heart to him, and that went on to the end of my life. And then I found that Shoghi Effendi's taste was excellent. He loved music. All the master's family seemed to have a great love for music. And he could never have enough music. But he liked, for instance, his favorite opera was Madame Butterfly. And he liked Rigoletto. He liked Carmen to some extent and Aida to some extent. But these were the things that he liked. I think the thing that made Shoghi Effendi happy all the 20 years that I was with him was just pure and simple the victories in the Baha'i faith. When, when the, you remember the inauguration of the 10-year plan and then his appeal at 131 territories, islands, and, uh, and uh, important districts of the world should be open to the Baha'i faith. And the, the conquest of the planet by these knights of Baha'u'llah, I gave them that beautiful title, you see, was tremendous. This brought him great joy. Then he wanted to have a national Baha'i center for every Baha'i country in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, Mrs. Collins contributed very heavily to that, the hand of the cause, Millie Collins, who lived with us. And she was a heavy contributor to that. And that brought great joy to his heart, that we could have these national Baha'i centers could be raised up all through uh, Latin America, North America. It's another source of happiness. Then when he found that uh, the contributions were coming in for the Kampala Baha'i Temple, and of course the, the victories of Martha Root, whom he called the star servant of the faith, um, are so great because she taught the first ruler of the world the Baha'i faith. And then these wonderful testimonials of Queen Mary of Romania brought great joy to the heart of Shoghi Effendi. So that anything that was a victory for the faith, the Baha'is accomplishing their goals, the Baha'is uh, fulfilling the, the opening the 131 virgin territories on the planet, uh, to the message of Baha'u'llah through the pioneers, you see. All of these things brought great uh, happiness and satisfaction to Shoghi Effendi. But we had, as I say, some very wonderful things happen at the Pilgrim House table, and one of them was a Baha'i who was a knight of Baha'u'llah for, where was it? The Orkneys, yes, the north of the islands north of the Great Britain, uh, Charles Dunning. And he looked very much like Popeye the sailor. <laughs> he, 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 he did. He, he was pigeon-breasted, which is a, a very uh, graphic description in English, but you have to know your English very well. It means people who are like a pigeon, you know, the bones are developed here in the narrow shoulders. 
And he had a mug, looked, as I say, remarkably like Popeye the sailor. And we knew that he was coming. We knew that he was one of the Knights of Baha'u'llah. But in those days, the, the, the uh, airplane service was only once, perhaps, or twice a week from different places. So we never knew exactly when the pilgrim was coming. We knew that they were coming the third week, say, of January, but we didn't know which day. So the doorbell of the pilgrim house rang, and Mr. I always told us afterwards, he went and opened the door, and he saw this little man standing there with a big, heavy turtleneck sweater and a mug, because really Charles had a face that was like a mug, and a little runt of a fellow, <laughs> and he thought that he was probably a bum. So he w th was going to say, you know, we, uh, we're not interested, and um, then he looked at him, and he knew we were expecting Charles Dunning. So he um, said, I'm Charles Dunning. He asked him who he was. said, I'm Charles Dunning. Well, then, of course, he was brought in and shown his room, and he came down to dinner with the Guardian and so on. And the Guardian was so entranced with that man. He was a very, very simple man. And as I say, Shoghi Effendi sat here. And he put Charles there, because Charles was the knight of Baha'u'llah. And he always put the prominent Baha'i here, for one, whatever they were, their position as a hand, or a knight of Baha'u'llah, or an elderly woman, or whatever, they went there. So Charles, I'll be the head now, and Charles was sitting here, and the guardian was there. And he just adored the guardian. And he, he leaned over like this. He said, guardian? Do you remember when you wrote that? You remember that? And his finger was under Shoghi Fendi's <laughs> nose like that. And Shoghi Fendi was enraptured with this man. So he leaned on the table like this, you see, smiling into Charles's face. And Charles's finger under his nose, guardian, you remember you said that? Oh, it was so adorable. And then when we went home, Shoghi Fendi said to me, oh, I like that man so much. He just loved Charles. That was very interesting, light on the Guardian. Then we had um, another Baha'i. He was the first Baha'i from America. And um, <laughs> <laughs> his name was Larry Houts. And he was of German uh, background, an American. And he was an insurance man, and a very successful one. And he was a member of the National Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States and Canada at that point. And um, Shoghi Fendi sent a cable to the American NSA saying, inform the Baha'i world, because they were the correspondent for all these cables, except direct messages in Persian to Persia. But the whole outlet for the Baha'i world was American NSA. So he said, infer inform the Baha'is that the door pilgrimage is open. Larry, being a member of the assembly, got terribly excited, and he went immediately and sent a cable asking for the privilege of pilgrimage. And um, then the phone rang a couple of days later, and the Western Union, a telegraph company, said, we've got a, a cable for you from Haifa. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And uh, he went and he got a pad and a pencil, and he told his wife to get on the uh, second telephone upstairs so she could hear this wonderful message from Haifa. And he said, all right, now read it to me. <laughs> it was addressed to Mr. House and so on. It said, welcome, Shogi. <laughs> it's very interesting. I mean, this was the Guardian, you see. Instead of saying a long speech in one paragraph because you're the first, he just said, welcome. Said, you're welcome. And then he signed it, Shogi, which is the way he signed up everything, and that was that. But uh, it was really marvelous. So Larry came, and um, he had on a tie that was a style in America. They had these very, very big ties <laughs> in those days, very wide ones. And this was hand-painted. <laughs> and it was a painting of an Arab in the desert sitting under a palm tree. <laughs> well, it was. <laughs> it's 
So he was sitting opposite the guardian, and I, I saw this happen, you know, and Shoki Fendi's eye would go to that time, <laughs> immediately remember his dignity and sit up straight and, you know, go on with his lecture on the Baha'i thing. <laughs> <laughs> Look again at I know the guardian used to wake up very early, which I deplored because he didn't get enough sleep and he had such tremendous amount of nervous strain and anxieties and responsibilities. But he would wake up about dawn and when he had finished seeing the pilgrims and we got home and he had uh, gotten to bed, it may have been say 10 o'clock, so he didn't have very much rest. And of course, as the years went by, he had much less rest because the demands on his time were greater and uh, the expansion of the cause um, constantly preoccupied Shoghi Effendi. And in the end, he worked all the time. He worked in, in London till um, the day that he died. A hundred years ago, this time, the blessed beauty, he announced, all lovers of the divine countenance, where are ye? How earnestly we wish that the beloved Shoghi Effendi were with us. I feel the Shoghi Effendi is watching us now. <laughs>